All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our final rules uh, webinar for wrestling this evening. Uh, we will have Chris Murray and um, Bob Whitaker uh, joining us tonight. Uh, Bob has a little bit of uh, experiencing, experiencing some technical difficulties right now. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Robbie start things off here in a couple of seconds. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules, kind of like we had in the past. If there's any questions throughout uh, the webinar tonight, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A box um, and we'll answer those um, uh, as needed, uh, depending on the, the, um, the question, if it's a general question uh, directed towards Robbie or myself about FHSA, we'll wait till the end. Um, if it's on the PowerPoint, we'll wait till there's a good stopping point uh, and we'll ask those questions. Um, so again, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. We hope all of you are safe. Um, hopefully you're excited for this upcoming season and uh, I will turn it over to Robbie. All right, good evening, Jeremy. Uh, good evening, folks. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Chris, just give me a thumbs up when uh, you all are good to go over there and uh, we'll, we'll turn it back over to you all. A um, couple things that I wanted to uh, start off with. I wanna thank you all for uh, taking the time out of your schedules to uh, be a part of this Zoom meeting. Uh, we will get to uh, Bob Whitaker and he, along with Chris Murray, and we will uh, go over the updated NFHS PowerPoint um, that the NFHS has shared with us here recently. Uh, but first, what you see on your screen is the uh, COVID-19 wrestling guidelines that we received from the uh, NFHS about two or three weeks ago. I, I take it back, two or three, um, it's actually been about four weeks ago. Um, and we reviewed these in our office. Um, and now Jeremy has shared these to the Arbiter Central Hub. Just kind of wanted to start the evening off by going over these and asking that any of your association presidents or booking uh, commissioners have these conversations with your schools about your expectations when you're there to officiate a match. Making sure that you're communicating with your athletic directors, with your coaches, your local um, folks here in your area that they have a clear understanding of each of these recommendations, these considerations, these guidelines that our office has shared with you as an official. Schools have got their own guidelines and expectations that we've given them. And what we ask them is, you know, they go over those and they go over those with their athletes, their coaches, their parents, um, as we've had considerations take part of what the NFHS SMAC committee and our office has reviewed the protocols that, and the considerations that we want them to follow. Um, and like I said, we ask that you communicate that with those athletic directors um, when, when you're having those conversations for the upcoming matches in November, if your area is going to start in November. Uh, you know, officials should be able, um, have that designated parking spot as you see in the second bullet um, from the public to make sure you have your spot that you are and you feel safe. Uh, this is something that I know as a former athletic director, that's one thing that we took important way years ago, pre-COVID, uh, we made sure we parked our officials um, off in a designated area. So they were away from those parents. As we all know, you know there, um, there are some heated contests and we would hate for a, a parent to follow an official out to a car. So that's the first thing, you know, expectations of officials and putting them in that central location of where they can be and away from um, any of the crowd uh, for that parking area. Um, having an administrator meet you all. I know there are times on the weekends where there may not be an administrator there. Have, have that coach, have somebody that's running that school meet you, you as an official at that designated location. Have that conversation um, with the school, with the host school of where you're going to meet, where you're going to be escorted. Are you going to a locker room? Are you going to a school office? Where are you going? Where are you going to be in between sessions? Um, where, what are requirements of an official on that campus? Uh, those are things that we ask that you please share with, um, with that athletic director, with that administrator on that campus so you know a designation that you're able to be at during, during the day, during that evening where you may be on campus. 
Um, we've also asked schools to have wash stations or sanitizer at mat side. Um, you know, if that's for you as an official to wiping your hands, uh, Bob Whitaker, actually, he and I had a conversation about student athletes um, using hand sanitizer. And as, as a consideration, that's what we put on here. Um, if, you know, we want to make sure that those schools are following those and that you make those requests. We ask that no official touches the score sheet, except the score um, with, with that school, with that host school. Officials, we ask that you please bring your own beverages and snacks to limit the contact of if there is a concession stand open. You know, you have your own stuff. You are, you're putting your hands on your own things and you're limiting that interaction um, at the concession stand. I know that kind of changes the norm of when an official goes and works a match, does the school provide a beverage or food? Um, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, that we ask that you take a look at. It's not something you have to follow, but it's something that you, um, you, you take a look at. And, you know, electronic payment method. How do you do that in your local association? Um, are you paid there at the match or are you paid? Um, are you, do you all bill the schools? Those are things that um, we ask that you take a look at in your association and share these expectations for our schools. Um, you know, then you look at the sus suspected cases at a contest, you know, if there's something, we basically share that information that, you know, make sure that student athlete, adult, parent, official, um, you know, the people are alerted there and they're transported from the facility. But that would be more of a school-based, um, a school uh, administrator would be the one that would um, be the ones that contact and have that emergency um, action plan if that were to arise. Um, and basically what we offered here, um, as you can see on your screen right now, is the sports specific provisions of what happens, and this is for all sports, uh, you know, what we see, each official, we ask that you please read through this. Uh, this is basically the COVID-19 guidelines that we provided for all of our officials throughout the state. If it's from girls volleyball down to, um, you know, baseball uh, from across the board, we want everybody to make sure, you know, the physical distancing, you know, six feet apart, um, you know, except for momentary interactions. And we know as wrestling officials, you're going to be on the mat with two student athletes and you are going to be there. Um, what, were, what were permitted provisions? You know, it's officials may use elect electronic whistles, which I know Bob is probably gonna touch on later on. You know, long sleeves are permitted. These are just all things that we've uh, provided. And, um, you know, if an official deems necessary that they may wear gloves, we actually had a, a question about if a student athlete was were, were to be deaf um, and participating in wrestling. And we reached out to the NFHS and the recommendation that they gave was if an official needed to make contact with that student athlete, they would recommend wearing that, that official wearing gloves if they felt the need. So that's one thing I did wanna to touch on. And I know Bob is actually gonna to touch on that a little bit later. Um, and then we, you know, we would allow an official to wear a plastic face shield um, if need be uh, to wrap around the forehead. That is just something that we would allow and we would not go against you all if you all wanted to do something like that to help your, uh, for, to help your safety. Um, you know, these, these are all different uh, provisions that we've allowed uh, working through SMAC committee, the NFHS, the FHSA, to feel what is best to keep our officials safe when they are officiating our games, matches, um, etc. So, you know, we, you know, cha changing your whistle several times during the day. If you're at an all, all day meet and um, you're there, bring, bring, bring extra stuff. You know, officials should not share, you know, that uniforms, apparel or equipment. You all are really good about, you know, making sure that you're arriving at the site and the facility and you, majority of y'all come dressed um, in your uniforms already. Um, you know, officials meeting with that administrator, like I mentioned earlier, a local, a location for you all to be able to designate your area of where you can be. So your social distance throughout the day at that match or that meet, um, if it's a duel, you know, where do you go? If it's two teams just battling it out that night, you know, are you just showing up and walking on and you guys are going, um, how, how are things, how are things going to be handled? 
Um, officials shall not physically contact players during the contest, um, which we know that is uh, one thing that wrestling officials may need to put their hand on the back. Um, but, you know, that's just something that you just need to take consideration of when you're actually doing that match. Um, officials will maintain uh, physical distancing with each other. If you have an assistant or conferencing about a call or talking to the head table, in those cases, um, you know, we just ask the officials, you know, use that six feet of um, social distancing when you guys are on the mat together. Um, but that's, that's pretty much what I had for from our office. Um, these are, like I said, highly suggested. And um, that's basically the information that I have. Before we get started, um, is there any questions before we turn it over to Bob? Um, looks like we got quite a few people online right now. So, um, you know, as we continue to uh, work through this, and this is the start, um, had many questions uh, this last week. Is the wrestling season gonna change? Are there anything, um, anything gonna be prohibited? Right now, there are no changes to the wrestling season. Um, the official start a date will be the first um, in November and um, currently still planning on having duels in January, state championships in March, uh, continuing to work through all of those. And um, at this point right now from the FHSA, you know, it's getting fall off the ground, which we are. Uh, we've got football games being played. We've got volleyball matches being played. Uh, cross country uh, meets are, are going. There are swimmers in the pool and we're, we're, we're going and we've got golfers on the golf course. And so there are exciting times um, going on and we've even got bowlers in the bowling alley. So fall, um, we are rocking and rolling with that. And before you know it, we'll, we'll be in the middle of winter and hopefully that winter is, um, is rocking and rolling and we're starting with uh, wrestling in November and that practice is starting. Uh, Jeremy, it looks like we have a question. Yeah. Uh, we write numbers, we write, we write weights on the shoulders using the same pin for all. Should this continue? And then secondly, what about the spectators' mat side? They are typically very close to us and the wrestlers. Ron, I'm going to let uh, Bob answer that first question about weights on their shoulders. I know that's something he wanted to talk about. Uh, our schools are actually, from my understanding, uh, working really hard uh, on social distancing inside their gymnasiums. Also, we're actually adding something to our guidebook uh, for wrestling that if a school can, they are to put a barrier actually around wrestling, the wrestling mats, if possible, to avoid this. This actually was a recommendation out of our officials advisory committee this year uh, from Jeremy Walton. And if, if there are bike racks or something during these big tournaments or if parents, you know, are on the floor, there is going to be a social distancing um, expectation for our schools. So I'm going to hold off on answering the first question. Ron, if Bob does not touch on that, please uh, bring it back to us later and we'll make sure we circle around that. If both officials have a mask, do you still suggest six feet? We're, what, what you feel comfortable is how we'll answer that. Um, you know, if you feel comfortable being close to another official, um, if that other official is comfortable with that, that'll, we'll leave that to y'all's desire on having that conversation. Chris, how are we on, on are we on uh, arrival times? Uh, Pat's ready to go. Uh, they wanted to have uh, Jeremy let Pat join. Jeremy, did you copy that? Yeah, let me uh, invite him here real quick. All right, again, I want to thank you all. Um, I know I'll close here later on uh, once, once uh, Bob goes through and Chris and Pat um, have their time to speak. Um, I'm here to answer any of these questions that you all may have FHSA related. Again, I want to thank you all. We have a great number tonight, um, wrestling community. Y'all are a tight knit group. And I can tell y'all we're excited about the upcoming wrestling season, getting it off the ground and uh, making, you know, being out there for our student athletes and you all as officials. And again, I want to thank Taylor and Jeremy uh, for putting this together for our wrestling officials um, throughout the state. 
I know it's, it seems every night Jeremy is on a Zoom call or a Zoom meeting. And, uh, we, uh, we do a lot, or I should say they do a lot uh, for our officials across the state and I can't thank them enough. But other than that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Chris. And once Pat and Bob join, you're going to quit hearing my voice. And we are going to um, move on. I got to commend my kids. This is probably the longest they've been quiet uh, for a really long time. So they're upstairs right now. Who knows what they're doing, but it's quiet up there. So that's kind of concerning. But um, looks like Chris is sharing his screen. And I'm going to turn it over to you all. And we're going to go ahead and get started with the 2020 NFHS wrestling rule changes. Bob, Bob, start talking. Hang on. Okay. Good to go. We try. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as soon as Pat and I get our technical difficulties worked out, I'll be on the screen, but I'm going to do it through my phone to Chris. Uh, he's going to put the slides up for us, and then we'll discuss them. And of course, if there are any questions or anything, just send them to Jeremy. He'll relay them uh, to us, and we'll answer them right away. Uh, let me just start by answering that first question about the magic marker on the thing. I really had not thought about that, but my instincts tell me right now that probably what we ought to think about doing, and we'll just look at this a little bit deeper, but my first remedy for it was to have some uh, paper towels there, and after you write on each one, just wipe the tip off, and that should be good to go, I would think. If anybody has any thoughts on that, let us know. It's something I had not thought of, but it certainly is a very good question. All right, let's go right into the rules. Uh, the first rule, there are 11 major changes. Some of them are going to affect wrestling a lot. Some of them are not. Um, you have to remember the uh, girls' wrestling will start, and everything seems to be a little bit different with that. And the first thing is having to do with their uniform. So we're going to go to rule 411C, and it says note. And I'll just read it first and talk about it. Uh, female wrestlers wearing a one-piece singlet and or a form-fitted compression shirt shall wear a suitable undergarment that completely covers their breasts and minimizes the risk of exposure. All contestants wearing a one-piece singlet shall wear a suitable undergarment which completely covers the buttocks and groin area. The rationale, this was needed to be consistent with the undergarment requirement for the singlet uh, and the compression shirt uniform top. Now, the problem is, is that officials especially if the first time you're going to see uh, these athletes is at weigh-in. So you're going to have to take a look at them and see if they meet those requirements. If not, you're going to have to make a correction before you allow them to get on the scale. And that doesn't mean they're going to lose their place, but just means that they, and again, you're going to have to talk to the coaches first. This is going to be one of the most difficult things, I think, is getting the coaches on board with this. But these requirements have to be met. Now, Let's go to 411C, female contestants again, you the play picture, the dotted lines clearly show what a undergarment shall be, and there should be no variance from that whatsoever. Questions on that? No, we're good, uh, Bob, keep going. Okay. Uh, we'll just move on to the next question. I'm sure there's going to be some discussions on these, which we'll, we can go back. We got all night. I do anyway. Uh, we're going to go to rule 413. And it talks about wrestling shoes reaching above the ankles if laces are visible. They shall be secured in an acceptable fashion. If the shoelaces come undone, the penalty would be an automatic stalling call. There is no change from last year. This is the change. If the shoe comes off during the course of wrestling, a technical violation will be assessed. Daniel Cook will be started to correct the situation. Now, the reason being, and everybody knows that most of these wrestlers, they don't lace them. They just slip them on. And I, my instincts tell me that you're going to see a lot of wrestlers trying to pull on the shoe. We've already seen that in some of our summer competitions because of that. So officials are going to have to be aware of that. But at the same time, coaches, we warn the coaches, listen, they're supposed to be warned the way the manufacturer 
designed them, and that's the proper release. And Chris, go to the rationale, if you will. Anyone you there? We're there. Okay. Uh, note, 425, a wrestling shoe that is properly laced will not come off. This is what the manufacturers are saying. So if it comes off, we're going to go with the fact that the wrestler did not have them properly secured. And the appropriate penalty will be levied at that particular time. And go to the play picture, if you will, with a shoe off. And you see the official in the upper uh, boxes. And I'm going to just stop right there because apparently I'm on. Okay. No, you're not. Okay. I hung up. Okay. Okay, which, which slide are we on? This is the one, the technical of the picture, okay? Questions on this? Yeah, we had a clarification um, to confirm laces undone equals stalling and shoe re removed equals technical violation. Correct. And just make sure if that shoe comes off, it's a technical violation. And the penalty would be, a, you know, a technical violation will be assessed. The engine clock will be started to correct the situation. Now, what, what means is important there is that becomes a charged injury timeout. To make sure it's not a freebie, it's a charged timeout. Okay. And again, the... Uh, okay, Pat, uh, Chris, go to the next uh, slide. I did. This should be 421. And this has to talk, this talks about hair. There actually is nothing, uh, there is no hairstyle at all now that is not allowed. The length can be whatever they want as long as it does not have anything that's abrasive in it. And they've decided that cornrows, uh, all the different names they have, some of the pictures that you see on the screen there. Uh, that has hair that is long, because we can no longer say legal length because now anything, any length is, is okay. Uh, if they decide that they want to wear hair covering, all the same rules that applied last year will apply to this. So if they have it in a, in a bobby pin or a hair net or a hair covering and it comes undone, the same penalties that occurred last year will occur this year. Again, hair length, there is no requirement. They can have to be as long as they want. And we'll get into the, somebody pulls their hair in another slide here. All right, four, two, one. During competition, all wrestlers shall be clean shaven. And I skipped over the part about the, uh, the bandanas, the, the screen keeps jumping around on me here. All right, I've already, this is, this is done. Let's go to the next one. Oh, um, Chris needs to change, there it is. Okay, again, the same rules apply. A bandana is not considered a legal hair cover. It must be, uh, the same rules apply that have always been, uh, just make sure that you know this before uh, rushing begins. Of course, if you do your pre-meet correctly, you'll see all that, you know, if a wrestler just asks the question, does anybody intend on wearing a legal hair covering? That's the time that you as the official must make the inspection, go through what they need to do, et cetera. Okay, let's go to the next one. Those must be questions. 
the next one. Go to the next one, Chris. Okay. Uh, under the new rules this year, it's going to be a lot different. Uh, male and female wrestlers will weigh in shoulder to shoulder. Of course, the time limits, et cetera, will remain the same. And they will weigh in wearing a singlet. And also with that singlet, they must have a suitable undergarment on. Now, again, you're going to have to take a look and just see if they make sure that they have a suitable undergarment. Don't go ask them anything. Just visually look at them. It's your responsibility to make sure that everybody gets on the scale correctly. Everybody must have a suitable undergarment. And they're, if they're going to wear whatever their competition uniform is going to be, they have to make weight in that exactly as they appear. Again, the same rule about socks. If they have socks on, they have to get on and they get on the scale with them. They have to stay with it. They do not make weight. They can go, they do not make weight based on that. Chris, you got to quit jumping around so much. <laughs> now, I know you're laughing, but. Don't change it unless he tells you. To. Just change it when I tell you, all right? Now, uh, 454, the referee or other authorized person shall supervise the weigh-in. Uh, there are no other authorized persons to supervise the weigh-ins other than the official. And the only thing that I can think of that might happen is that the official was delayed and could not get there and made contact with the athletic director of the head coach and say, I'm going to be late and authorized a head coach to conduct the weigh-ins. And of course, that would be your responsibility to make sure the coach, they know anyway what the requirements are, but just refresh their memories, just go over it. And of course, as soon as you can get there, uh, then you would immediately be in charge once you're on site following the rules. Okay, next slide. Russia shall weigh in wearing their competition uniform with a suitable undergarment. Get that out there. Uh, socks low cuts may be worn. Now, what is low cut? That, you know, was a kind of pain in the ass last year. You know, what is low cut? The ankle bone is for your, is your measuring stick. If they're above the ankle bone, they're not low cut. If they're right at the ankle or the edge of it, you can be a little lenient, but that's the barometer we're going to use. The ankle bonus determines whether they're low cut or not. If they come above the ankle bone, they're not low cut socks, you just tell them to take them off. Okay, next slide. No equipment can be worn during the course of weigh-ins. That is nothing. No knee pads, no sleeves, no additional taping, anything like that. Uh, nothing can be worn during the weigh-in period. They, special equipment, no change here. They have to be presented. And again, they're making sure that the contestants are, shall weigh in wearing without anything, no ear guards. Uh, you're gonna see it as sure as the world, that they're gonna they have something that they may wanna hide. Just make sure that before you get on the scale, just look them over. You're going to do a skin check anyway prior to that. Next slide. You jumped two ahead, of Chris. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know why you keep jumping ahead like that. Do you hear me, Chris? Where do you want me to be? Four, five, four, five, seven, note. Just go to four, five, seven, note. The one in front of you. You get there. Okay. Now, the committee believes that the what they have done will simplify for uh, all competitors, besides the legal uniform, uh, the socks, etc. That will prevent uh, rushes from uh, weight loss or gain. And we believe we will protect the individual athletes. And again, your responsibility once you begin the weigh-in procedure is to make sure you visually just look at everybody correctly. If there's more than one official, which we have a procedure uh, set up that they will get them ready before they get on the scale. Uh, it should not be a big problem. And again, you have to can't go take their uniform off. They got to make weight wearing whatever they're going to compete in. 
And that includes the suit of undergarment. And again, that going back to 411C note, you'll see the dotted lines that clearly outlines what each gender should be wearing. You don't have to go back there. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Okay, I gotta get rid of that, I can't. Here, here's, here's what you're reading. Okay. Uh, 5291, uh, I just kind of hope that this uh, doesn't happen a lot, but certainly there's gonna be a pair, appear to be opportunities where somebody is grabbing or pulling the hair, and that is illegal, and it's a penalty for it, it's unnecessary roughness. This is not a crude hair that's caught in a legal maneuver, but you're gonna have to use your good judgment here, see whether or not somebody uh, intensely grabs somebody's hair to gain an advantage or keep from getting scored upon. You're gonna have to be, pay attention, especially with somebody that has really long hair. You may not be able to see it. We've seen many cases during the summer where these long-haired uh, wrestlers, uh, sometimes it appears that their hair is being pulled and it's really not. So you're gonna have to get yourself in a position to observe that. Okay, and again, it's unnecessary roughness and it's a penalty point. Next slide. Yeah, we don't. Hang on, it keeps going backwards. Chris, you keep going too many slides. You're on five, rule 529.1. You're way ahead, right okay, there. Okay, there we go. And again, the rationale for it, the practice could cause injury to the neck and should be penalized accordingly. So again, if you see it, get in closer, take a good look, make sure that that's really not happening. If it's just competition, you're gonna let it go. If somebody's got a handful of hair and they're yanking, pulling, stop the match. Penalize them accordingly. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna, okay, 731. Going out of the wrestling area or forcing an opponent out of the wrestling area by either wrestler is a means of avoiding wrestling. In an imminent scoring situation is a technical violation. Both wrestlers should make every effort to remain in balance. When the referee feels that either wrestler has failed, make every effort to stay in balance in an imminent scoring situation. The offending wrestlers shall be penalized for fleeing the mat. There can be no technical violation of fleeing the mat if near fall points or takedown has, has been ordered. And that rule has not changed. Next slide. And if the offensive rush has scored a takedown or near, far, near fall, there can be no technical violation. All four, the fleeing wrestler would be penalized fleeing the mat, and the wrestler that earned a takedown would be rewarded with a takedown plus the technical violation. The committee felt that that was too harsh, and they're just uh, going to take it if they flee in the mat, which you would put the signal first. If he secures the takedown, the technical violation would disappear, and only a two point takedown would be awarded. And again, if he is not successful in getting the takedown, then it would just be a technical violation for fleeing the map. Okay, we're already done with 731. I think this next one, 814, the stalling penalty chart. Uh, this is this, I think this is good. Warnings and penalties stalling are cumulative throughout the match and penalized independent of the progressive penalty chart. This is not a change. Now this is the major change. Always before that there would have to be a match stoppage before the two point or the wrestler would get a choice of a position. Now the match shall be stopped immediately on the fourth offense and the opponent shall be awarded two points and given choice of position. A fifth offense shall result in uh, disqualification. Now, what's good about that is that now the official doesn't have to wait. If you have a penalty that's going to be the fourth penalty for stalling, you're going to blow the whistle, you can award the points as you do it, whatever you're going to, however you want to go about it, but at that time you're going to stop the match immediately and give the opponent his choice of position regardless of where the mat is. If there's one second left, you shouldn't be looking at the clock anyway, but 
As soon as you do it, blow the whistle, show the selling point, and go on from there. Next, there we go. And here's a, here's a couple of good examples of it. Uh, the pictures, somebody just crowding on, laying on top of them, whatever you want to do. See the official just making the stall warning. He's awarding two points. He's already blown the whistle, and the match shall be stopped, and his opponent gives him the choice of position. And we've already done that one under the fourth penalty sign. Go to the next slide. Hey, Bob, real okay. quick. Say what again? happens? What happens if the fourth stall is between periods? You know, let me get. What I'm happens right. if, the, if the fourth stall is between periods? Uh, I'm not following. If it's between periods. Yes, that, that was the question. Well, I, I really can't think of anything unless somebody is the is not getting uh, not following the official's direction to get set. And I would say at that particular point, the interpretation would be that Russell would immediately give it his choice of uh, position wherever it is. No matter where it happens, the fourth stalling uh, is a choice of position for the opponent and a two-point penalty. So if it's during... Uh, when the clock is not running, he's uh, fooling around, not getting into position, and the official feels he's interrupting the early flow of the match. He wants to hit him for stalling, hit him, and that opponent immediately gets a choice of position. Okay? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to go to 829. And... This one's going to be something everybody's going to have to pay attention to. This is a new rule that I think uh, the committee uh, labored over. Uh, from what I understand, you know, they spent more time on this rule than any other one. But uh, let's get to it. When a match is stopped for an injury during an eminent scoring situation, and the referee determines that scoring, takedown, reversal, escape would have been successful uh, had resting continued, Referee shall charge the injury timeout to the injured wrestler, injured contestant, and award applicable points to the non-injured wrestler. And what they're trying to get around of uh, the wrestler that uh, starts spinning his finger when he's got about to get taken down, about to get reversed, and that includes a legitimate pinning combination, which would be a half Nelson, an arm bar, a cradle, and he may not be in criteria, but if he spins his finger and wants a timeout, you can't deny him the entry timeout. Or well, you would say that it's, this is an imminent scoring situation and you're going to be a charge timeout and two points would be awarded to the opponent. Now, again, if it's a takedown or reversal, that's pretty easy to get along with. The Harvards are going to be, when it gets to you have a legitimate pinning combination. Not some way they're head to toe in a funk move or something like that. That's not a legitimate pinning combination, and that does not meet the requirements of this rule. It has to be something that, again, F. Delson, arm bar, cradle, anything like that that would put him in the back, you know, if he was continued on. Then you would have to, that would be an eminent situation. And again, we're going to do our video will be done. Those will be some of the things that we're going to show in it. Uh, and we've got a whole bunch of uh, different situations that we're going to put up, but it should not be as difficult as it sounds here. But again, the official, if that finger spins, you have to grant that timeout. And if you feel it was imminent, you're going to award the appropriate points and move on and discharge the timeout. Okay? Go to the picture, Chris. There you go. And you see that the official has signaled entry timeout. He's also signaled two points for the red wrestler. And you hear the see the thing rep my elbow. Right? He's spin his knee, then uh, he's injured. That was a, of course, this is a takedown. 
and he's not in control yet. So entry timeout, two points. Okay. Is that the end of them here? This is now the changes. Yeah. Okay. Four one four. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, this is about uh, people got uh, pretty free with uh, some of the stuff that they were officials were really stringent in the beginning, but little action at the end of the year with stickers and so forth that they didn't see, didn't look at, and of course it always happens during something when a coach comes to the table and says he's got a sticker or something on his ear guard, something that you should have caught as you watch them come on the mat. Okay. Again, you need to be, be aware. Next slide. And again, you see what they, uh, what's for the future, any manufacturer's logo trademark reference that appears on the wrestling ear guards, including legal care, Coverage can be no more than two and a quarter inch square inches with no dimensions more than two and a quarter and may appear no more than once in the air guard. In other words, you can't have them on both sides. No initial manifest, you can't wear two things. It can't be one on one side and one on the other. Next slide. And again, this is uh, for private, same thing with uh, something. Uh, and they're showing there's something towing company on there. Those things are not allowed. Okay, 5245D. And again, stalling. It is stalling when they can test in the advantage position. Subarticle AC remain the same, stays behind the opponent while they're on his or her feet, making no attempt to bring the opponent to the mat. Clarification to make sure that rule 674D and 5244D read the same. And this is just an editorial change. Nothing really has changed in the rule. Next slide. Now, I want everybody to pay really good attention here because this, uh, we even beat this up even this afternoon. Uh, Want to make sure that the way we conduct this, when you arrive on site, after you say hello to everybody, of course, and say, do you have an appropriate healthcare professional assigned to this event? If they do, that person will be, just make them aware you're going to go through the procedure. And again, at no time can the official make the protocol signal unless he is directed to do so by the appropriate healthcare professional. Now, Bunch of times during the course, even of our state tournament, I heard officials say when the trainer was out there, I think he hurt his neck. I think he lost consciousness. You're not an MD. You cannot say anything like that. You have one responsibility to do once it stop the match, ask for the trainer. Once they say they want to uh, evaluate them, you're going to give the concussion protocol signal. Now, the major change here from last year is the time. And I'll give you a good example here. Let's just say that the injury timeout was requested. You stop the match, injury timeout, you have the appropriate healthcare professional on site, and they come out, and one minute has gone by, and he says, I think I need to assess him for a um, rusher to have a possible central nervous system, uh, neck, anything like that, and you give the signal. That time now counts. Use one minute of time, that the protocol time now becomes four minutes. And this is a change from last year where the actual entry time disappeared. So I'm sure we're gonna have some questions on it. I would hope it would be anyway. But again, you have to be aware of where you are. You have a protocol going on. And that time that was used, you need to make the table is aware of it, that you use one minute. There's four minutes left in that thing. The clock would continue to run, but that injury time would be uh, used up. 
And if he's okay and he's returned to uh, competition, he would have 30 seconds left of injury time should there be another one. And of course, if there's another injury time where there's a concussion protocol, that would eliminate that rusher from any further competition. And again, the editorial change was, uh, that was left out of last year's uh, rule book. So that's why that came about. Okay. Here we go, 763E, comma F. It is saw one from the neutral position when a wrestler. Oh, that's, go to the next slide, Chris. Hey, real quick, Bob, does 524-5D yep. include the final overtime period? Yes, any time. And again, I'm going to say in the course of uh, the events that uh, we were involved in uh, last year, I'm going to say maybe 10 times during the course of probably 30 bouts that there was an appropriate healthcare professional available. So lacking one, of course, we won't have to go into any part of it whatsoever. It's just a normal injury timeout. If we're lucky enough to have that qualified person there, make them in charge. And again, one of the biggest complaints that we had last year was an official trying to tell the appropriate healthcare professional that he blacked out, he, his eyes rolled back in his head. And again, you're not a doctor. You shouldn't be talking to him whatsoever. You let him do his job. He is the qualified person, okay? And again, the neutral uh, selling position, uh, again, nothing, nothing really changed. Uh, we just want that called. And the, the clarification was they made 5243 and 763 read the same, okay? Next slide. Okay. And again, this is the head coach has the obligation to ensure that each wrestler is properly equipped and in proper uniform. No question about his responsibility. And once he verifies it, no matter what happens, he's the guy, no matter, he's going to get penalized along with his wrestler, whatever happens. Next. And again, this is uh, equipment. Uh, he, is, he is the adult who is responsible that he trusts the skin and nails are suitable and compliant for competition. And again, you have to have, we shouldn't be having any uh, problems. And during the weigh-ins, of course, they're going to be in a singlet or a competition uniform now. And again, I'm going to go very carefully here. You cannot ask somebody to drop their shoulder straps or pull up their pants leg or anything like that. You're going to evaluate them from what you can see. You're still going to go through the procedure, check their, you're not going to check hair anymore because it's not necessary, but you're certainly going to check their nails, make sure that they don't have braces on and just make them turn and look at their shoulders, look at their thing down to the ankles. And again, somebody asked me a while ago, why does the socks uh, prevent it? It's very unlikely that uh, any kind of bacteria like ringworm or impetigo or something like that ever goes below the ankle bone. That's why that's like that. So we don't have to worry about that. Okay, next. And again, the suitable undergarment, these are pretty easy. Uh, if it's light colored or white, once wet from perspiration, the unicorn can become transparent. Without the proper undergarment, it makes the wrestler feel self-conscious and anyone around the area feeling uncomfortable. So again, you have to take a look when you first see them. Make sure that you, if you believe that, you need to tell the head coach. Don't do not tell the wrestler, tell the head coach that make sure that they have a suitable undergarment. And we are encouraged that wrestling is inviting to so many girls. However, we have to ensure that their breasts are completely covered and supported for the vigorous rigors of the interscholastic wrestling. And again, don't be afraid to use the word breast. It's a common term, but 
cover. You have to have a some kind of covering on to make sure that they there's no exposure. Next. And again, this is for the MADS, and but it really has nothing to do with the officials. But we hope that every uh, school is going using their best to uh, disinfect and make sure that everything we touch is clean. And I'm going to say that probably somewhere down the line, we're going to see the shoe thing come back into play where we've had it, it never left, but nobody does it anymore. They used to have buckets there or, or trays that, with uh, cleaning composition in it, and the rest would step in and then walk out on the mat. And everybody kind of got away from that. And that, that's up to the whole school. Next. And again, here's the thing, communicable diseases are a major concern is for rushing and any infectious disease outbreak has the potential to end a team's season or even a state or suspend the course across the entire state. Of course, we all know about Wisconsin that has shut the entire sport down for a month to get all their ringworms under control. And again, coaches, that's your responsibility. Officials, all we're doing is interpreting what we see. And again, same thing on uh, this one here, just a continuation. And this is the coach's responsibility, the wrestling rooms. To me, that has nothing to do with the officials. Uh, of course, if they somebody asks you, just say, hey, this is something they need. To, everything needs to be uh, disinfected. Hard, non porous gear, such as wall mats, floors, and surface should all be cleaned on a regular basis. It seems to become the norm now across the country that everything, uh, everything we see is being wiped down, sprayed, disinfected. So I'm sure this is going to occur. Now, I had spoke with uh, Robbie earlier during the week, and they had a uh, considerations that were sent out to all the coaches, and we're waiting to hear what, that, uh, what they have to say about that. Uh, if a wrestler wants to, and I would say when you first get to the thing, coach, you're going to have a, some kind of disinfectant, a hand sanitizer available at the table. If they say yes, great. Have the wrestlers wash their hands before coming out on the mat, and the officials should wash your hand, disinfect your hands immediately upon each mat. Just walk to the table, sanitize your hands, and come back. And again, that would be up to each individual school. Next. And again, these are talking about a stronger, there's a couple of things out on the market now that are stronger than chlorine bleach and water solution. Uh, Nobody really knows for sure. It's not our problem right now uh, that whether or not they use it or not, we wouldn't know if they did, uh, but certainly we really hope. Uh, you'll see a lot of these schools now, they have these machines that they put on the mats, an ultraviolet uh, machine that runs across it on its own and runs across the whole mat and disinfects it. Those are probably the best, but of course, only the richer schools and uh, people who have a stronger athletic budget can afford those things. Next. And again, this is just personal hygiene. Uh, we all know that just about everybody, wrestlers are, the, are the, probably the worst. When they get done with practice and so forth, nobody jumps in the shower. They just throw their clothes on. They head home or wherever they're going. By the, by the time they get home, they take their clothes off. They still don't shower and they jump in bed. And whatever they had with them is going to stay right in their bed clothes until somebody eventually they're going to get ringworm, infantago, something like that. So again, coaches, it's your responsibility to tell everybody to educate them on this procedure, these procedures. Next. We're done with that one. Go to the next. And again, this is a, uh, I had a coach, not, not in this state, but tell me that their showers are the biggest storage area in gyms now because nobody uses the showers. Nobody wants to take a shower, so they become storage areas. So coaches, I encourage your athletes to shower after every practice, after every match, just to, just to stay clean. And same way they are, right here. Next. And again, we're talking about personal hygiene. 
uh, sharing again, this is something really for coaches, uh, not really for us. Uh, so we can pass this up. We already know what we're supposed to do. And again, here's, here's the same thing. If uh, somebody wishes to wear some kind of a hair covering and so forth, it must still maintain the rule. And should they come out, put their hair in a rubber band, something like that, then it comes out, it's going to be charge injury timeout, well, you have to replace it. And I can't imagine this being a major problem, because I think what's happened in the States, it had no hair rule last year, they have to add zero problems whatsoever. Next. And again, this is, again, just describing what I just talked about. Uh, and you would have to, if they're going to wear it, same rule as last year, you have to wear it to weigh-ins, and they have to make sure that it's legal. And again, simply tell them that they cannot be anything that's a hard material, sharp or abrasive, such as beads, bobby pins, barrettes, hair pins, or hair clips. A rubber band is the only thing that really works. The little scrunchies and so forth, they say, they stretch out, and you, especially the female wrestlers, you see them constantly rewinding them. They stretch out every time they do it. So a rubber band is the absolute very best thing if somebody wants to wear it that way. Now, this was discussed earlier today about shaking hands uh, for sportsmanship. We, our sport really shake hands more than any sport in the world. These we do it in a, the Lehigh introductions. We do it before matches. We do it after the matches. Then they do another team shaking hands. Everybody's shaking hands a lot. We want to get away from that. And we find that the best thing that it's doing is a simple fist bump. Now, if somebody wants to shake hands, you can't stop them. You have to let them do it. But we would encourage that. And again, your pre-meet, let them know. The fist bump is the appropriate thing to do before and after. Now, the officials, you will not raise their hands at the end of the match. You will simply, if green is the winner, you will simply raise your green hand above your head. And if the athlete wants to jump up and down and, and raise his own hands, then that's great. But you're not touching them. We want to make sure just keep us down. Any questions? And also, oh, my bad. They are not allowed to go shake hands with the opposing coach anymore. You have to make clear of that. Again, coaches, I know it's a sportsmanship thing, but we're just not going to get into it, so we're not going to allow it. Hey, Bob, for girls' uniforms, there's a question. Um, a lot of them like to wear compression shirts. Is that allowed? Yes. As long as it covers their breasts. Thank you, sir. Okay. And again, you see the weigh-in protocol we have that, that should be on the screen now. And again, these are very different variations of them. Uh, most of the uniforms that are be being manufactured now, especially uh, for females, have a, you can see they clearly have a higher cut neck, and that's by design, you know, to minimize the risk of exposure, but still they have to wear a suitable undergarment. And again, you have to take a look to see. Do not approach the athlete to simply tell the head coach, coach, this, rest, this individual needs to have a Super undergarment on. Okay, that's the end of that. Uh, questions? Uh, I'm here now. Yeah, I'm here all night. Uh, if somebody wants to give me a call or something like that, something that you didn't get a chance, we went too fast or something, uh, certainly give me a call. I'm available and discuss anything at all. We do have and a that's, couple. Yeah, uh, pretty good for us. We do have a couple that we'll reach uh, or circle back to here, Bob. Or uh, yeah, Bob, uh, for stalling walkouts and pushouts, have the signals each been added? I'm assuming, it, like in the book or anything. No, that's just simple. You know, just just for your stall call. You don't have to have a signal for it. Unlike college, where we do have a definite signal that are required to be used, high school does not has not added any additional signal. So it's simply, simply a stall call. And any award points are just a warning to go from there. 
okay? Uh, a kid has a half that looks potentially dangerous and grunts. Do we give a near fall and stop the, and stop the match? Same as any other potentially dangerous situation? Yes, same and nothing changed there. And the last one I have is kind of uh, going back to that fourth stalling. Uh, they re they retyped it. If fourth stalling happens at the end of the period and the non-offending wrestler already has choice at the new period, does he, she get another choice after the first restart of the new period? No. And I, I really, I'm, I'm gonna be kind of amazed if that situation really happens, but you never know. It's very possible, but I, I just don't uh, foresee that uh, happening that often, or if it happens at all. Those are all the questions I have right now. If anyone uh, would like to add any other questions or have any other questions, um, before we log off, Robbie, do you have anything uh, that you want to add? Yeah, there was one in the chat, Jeremy. Um, and I don't know what it refers to, Bob. It says, opponent pulls it off. Is that equal unsportsmanlike? Uh, that, was, that was the first one, Bob, about the shoes. If the, uh, if the opponent pulls off the shoe, um, does that equal unsportsmanlike? No. It doesn't. The shoe cannot come off if it's on done properly. The shoe cannot come off. The manufacturer is, again, we've gone up one side and down the other with this. Everybody remembers the video of the Ohio tournament uh, where you, you clearly could see that the wrestler was working on it and they challenged the manufacturer and they put a whole bunch of tests to it. If they're laced up the way they're supposed to, they're saying it absolutely cannot come off. And we all know, we've seen them. You just look at these wrestlers, their laces are just light and they have these Velcro over locking devices and they just put them on, and so they, they come off quite easily uh, based on that. Again, this is, you know, something for the coaches to work on. All we do is enforce the rule. If it comes off, the appropriate penalty should be administered. Anything else, Robbie? We good? No, I'm good. Uh, Bob, I want to thank you and Pat and Chris uh, for taking your time and uh, looking forward to the uh, YouTube video, um, the yearly um, creation of that as you're a YouTube sensation throughout the nation now. Um, uh, they, we have a bunch of skits that we're going to, especially about these imminent scoring uh, situations, which uh, I believe they're going to be the most difficult, especially for younger officials uh, to determine because what's going to happen is you're going to just, just without a doubt, a coach is going to come flying up to the table saying that was eminent. You should have got the points. And we just need to have a little education. I think the videos that we're going to do, hopefully we're going to cover enough of them. And in my mind, I have five or six different situations that I want to present. And I'm going to rely on uh, Chris and uh, uh, Zach and a couple other guys across the, the state uh, Jeremy Walton, uh, all those guys, they, you know, they, they're in touch with me all the time. Uh, if they have something that they want to see, uh, it's too darn easy for us to do it. We can, we can set up a demo. We have the wrestlers available, and we're going to get this thing. We're going to get it done quickly this year. We're not going to have to wait because our source is now closed due to the uh, pandemic. So we're going to have a local high school that we know will be available, and we're going to get this situation, get it filmed and get it out to everybody right away. And hopefully we'll have the same success that we've had in previous years where our video has been accepted across the country. And again, it, it comes from ideas that come from our officials. I rarely get a call from a coach that has something that they would like to see. Officials always have some, probably because they've experienced it during some uh, competition that they really weren't quite sure about what to do or what to call. And we give it, we'll try and put it to actual use and demonstrate it. So. Uh, I'm available all the time. Just give me a caller. I'll be happy to include it. It wouldn't every even if it's not good. I'll listen to it and we'll decide what to do with it. Sounds good. So anything? yeah, we got a couple more um, questions in the in the Q and A. So if the lace at at the initial uh, start of the match, if the laces are properly tied and the shoe comes off, what do you call? Technical violation. Technical violation. All right. And then um, other one, fourth stalling, possible scoring situation, not returning to Matt from rear standing, 
do we no longer give opportunity for the bottom to bottom man to score? No. If you got the official feels that strongly that he wants to administer a stall call, it should be what the situation should not matter. Simply make the stall call, award the two points, and make the appropriate adjustment in position. All right. Well, that's uh, the question. I didn't know if you, you didn't get a chance to answer. You have anything, Chris? Um, thanks a lot, Chris, for all the work you did uh, helping us get on here. We knew we were going to have some technical difficulties on the way here. So, well, it went great, and uh, hope everybody learned something. And uh, we're looking forward to having a great season. And thanks to you, Robbie, you and Jeremy, for all your work and guiding us along this uh, route. Uh, this is going to be a special year. Uh, your enthusiasm that we start on time is great. Uh, we're all geared up. Our uh, training uh, officials across the state. They now have an opportunity. I will be happy to come to every any association meeting and go over anything you want. Just tell me when and where and I'll show up. Of course, it can't be on a weekend when we have competition, but before we get started, it really doesn't make a difference where it is. I have the time. I'll be happy to travel to your meetings, sit down, discuss, just like we're doing now. I, I did four associations last year. I'll be happy to do all of them. And to piggyback on that, Bob's even agreed to meet with your coaches as well. So if you want to yep. meet with coaches as well um, during those coaches meetings, um, you know, he's there, he's available. Uh, let me know um, if I can make it, I'll be happy to make it as well. Um, but yeah, we got one more question before we leave. Wrestler no takes problem. a minute injury time and doctor states that he wants to assess concussion. Three minutes later, doctor clears the wrestler to continue. Does that wrestler have any more injury time left? Now, just go to tell the addition one more time. I just said everything just for the time frame. How much the injury time had lapsed? Wrestler takes one minute injury time and the doctor's okay. assessing the concession, concussion. Three minutes later, the doctor clears the wrestler to continue. So I'd say we're at four minutes. Does the wrestler have any more injury time left? No. He's entitled to a minute and a half injury time. The concussion protocol can last no more than five minutes. And he forced it again. This is a major change from last year that they felt that it was being abused to the point that uh, people were signaling for a concussion. And again, a lot of that happened, which I just told you before, that the official was instrumental in saying, I think his lost consciousness. I saw his eyes roll back in his head. That is none of your business. Your job is to simply call a timeout. And if the appropriate healthcare professional summons you to the match and you should have already gone through this with him, what the procedure be? If you want to assess him, you call me back. You tell me you want to assess him. Then and only then does the official give the appropriate signal. And the time used, you have to go to the table, make sure if one minute's gone, that means he's got four minutes left to assess that individual. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and close now. Bob, I want to thank you for that explanation on um, the injury time and then the, con the concussions as well. Um, Jeremy Taylor, I want to thank you all as well. My eye really shows up, doesn't it? What's that? My eye. <laughs> <laughs> My fake eye. Yeah, you see that. Um, I want to thank you all. This is one of our highest attended um, wrestling Zoom meetings that we've had this year. Um, well, thank everybody for taking the time out. I know we've gone way over. But you know what? We feel this one was very important to, um, to do that and to go over the rules and uh, epic just rule changes. Oh, one more thing, Robbie. Pat wants you to pay for his speeding ticket mm. that he got. He's trying to rush here. So he'll be happy to send you that document. So please pay that right away. All right. Sounds good. Tell Pat to put on that golf tournament again, and we'll uh, make sure we make it that way. Okay. Sounds good. All right. All right, well, I want to thank you all, Chris. Thank you for taking the time and uh, setting all that up for uh, Pat and Bob. Bob, I appreciate you as well. And Taylor and Jeremy, uh, we'll see you all soon. Okay. Take care, thank everyone. You much. Good night, everyone.